cloud. <laughs> All right. Carmen Aguirre is a Chilean Canadian, award winning theater artist and author who has written and co written over 25 plays, including Chile con Carne and other early works The Refugee Hotel, The Trigger, Blue Box, Broken Tailbone, and Anywhere But Here, as well as the number one international bestseller, Something Fierce Memoirs of a Revolutionary Daughter, winners of CBC Canada Reads in 2012 and its best-selling sequel, Mexican Hooker, number one, and my other roles, one of my favorite titles of all time. <laughs> other roles since the revolution, which is not unimportant. <clears throat> She's currently writing an adaptation of Euripides Medea, commissioned by Vancouver's Rumble Theater, Moliere's The Learned Ladies for Toronto's Factory Theater, a short digital piece for Ontario's Stratford Festival entitled Floating Life, and an untitled play on the life of famed 20th century Italian photographer and revolutionary Tina Modotti for Vancouver's Electric Company Theatre. Reframed, an outdoor performance piece about online discourse, conceived and co-created with the Electric Company, received its world premiere on October 7th, 2020 in Vancouver. Commissioned by Ottawa's National Theatre Arts Centre for its Grand Acts of Theatre Initiative. Carmen is a core artist at Electric Company Theatre, a co-founding member of the Canadian Latinx Theatre Artist Coalition, and has over 80 film, TV, and stage credits, including her award-winning lead role in the Canadian premiere of Stephen Adley Gurigi's The Motherfucker with the Hat, and her Leo-nominated lead performance in the independent feature film, Bella Ciao. She looks forward to starring in Cecilia Araneda's stunning debut feature film, Intersection, to be shot in Winnipeg in spring 2021, and in the Canadian premiere of Melinda Lopez's one-woman show, Mala, at Vancouver's Arts Club Theatre. Carmen is a 2020 Seminovich Prize finalist, the most prestigious theatre award in Canada, and she's a graduate of Studio 58, where I will say she was a colleague of John's. So no, a student. I was a student. Well, yes, a student. <laughs> a student colleague. So, so welcome, bienvenida. We are happy you are here. Um, the way I've structured this is that you and I will have a conversation for a bit, and then we'll open it up and have a conversation with the students, okay? Sure. And I, I as I say, I could talk to you all day. <laughs> and I'm not going to I'm not going to cut to the chase, which I could do because some of the students have in their interaction with the video. But I want to start in a sense where you start the video. Um, so we're in this class, which is about what it is to be a witness. And I tell the students that every trigger warning in the book, just consider it. Here we go, because we don't know what we'll talk about. We just know it will be, there'll be a lot of blood and it won't be easy. Um, and so this question of how do you interact with and pass on a story that is not yours, or at least is not evidently yours, or what does it mean to have an honest relationship with somebody else and with someone else's story? All these things are what we're struggling with here. So you, st you, st you start with land, really. And you know here we are, we're in Kingston, at least, the Queen's University parts of this is. We're in Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe territory. We're trying to understand what that means for us, what our relationship to that it means. And then we have this multitude of students with many different roots, some of which we don't even know about and we're trying to learn about. So I'm interested in how you talk about Chile and Canada, and you also start with song. And you, you talk about, you say the words have deep roots within me. So with our students, I've been asking them something about who they are and what they bring to the moment and how what they bring is this mixture of, um, of shame and celebration of terrible histories and beautiful histories and how do we hold all those together. So I just wondered if you'd say something about what it is for you to start there. 
Yeah, so first of all, I would like to acknowledge that I am on unceded uh, Squamish territory, which is downtown Vancouver, where, where I'm talking to you from, and that I am most definitely not a settler. I am a visitor. And um, so I say in the video that I was raised in exile. So what that means to me, it, it's very much about the relationship to the land. Uh, I never would have left uh, my land, Chile, if I hadn't had to. Uh, I did not come here as an immigrant to um, reinvent myself, to lay down roots here, or to you know climb a social ladder. Um, so therefore, my relationship to this land is is very different. <laughs> also, it's very clear to me um, that the forces that uh, exiled my family and I from Chile are the same forces that settled this country, right? The forces of capitalism, imperialism, and colonization. We have the same history. Um, so as far as I am concerned, um, the Americas is one, you know, I'm really, really um, in favor of Simon Bolivar's vision from the 1820s. Uh, Simon Bolivar was the liberator of Abiyayala, which is the indigenous name in the Guna language for Latin America. And um, his vision, which obviously was not his own individual vision, it was the vision of a whole movement, um, was that all of the Americas be one, a borderless land, you know, Turtle Island and Abiyayala. So that is the lens through which I uh, like to look at all of this land that we call uh, the Americas. And I could go on here for a while, Julie, about land. So <laughs> knowing that we don't have a lot of time, maybe I'll just stop there. I don't know if I've um, answered your question. I think that's really helpful. And also um, I'm thinking about the, you know, I'm thinking that my students are young, right here we are, I mean, younger than us. <laughs> and I, and, having spent the last week reading you, so having just completed the second memoir, um, I feel this kind of vicarious connection that a reader has with this, the writer around you in your younger days, right? And what is it to be angry and to be exhausted and to be fed up and to maybe want to tear down everything and to have no faith in people, you know, no trust in people. And yet, you're asking and insisting in a really, for me, hugely important and healthy way, but maybe difficult way, that we, that we talk to each other and that we have, a, what do you call the sovereignty of thought? And so I'm, I'm, I'm interested, so I wanna go there in a second, but just to stay with where you are at the moment, I, I'm very interested when you say that identity is a, class, is a middle class politics. And I found myself immediately resonating with that and then trying to figure out how would I articulate why that makes so much sense to me. So I thought, well, I'll ask Carmen to articulate it instead. I just wondered if you'd say a little more about that in terms of One America, in terms of Bolivar, in terms of the relationship. Just, just last on this, when I was able to be in Argentina with my friend Victor, who you know, he talked a lot to me about the, the difference between whether we see ourselves as individuals or whether, and you know, manifest destiny for the individual, my right to my bliss, follow my bliss, who am I in this world, follow my dream, and who am I in a community, a family, and how different that is, perhaps, and how some of us get nurtured and grown up. So I'm interested in what middle class means. <laughs> There's another, just anything from there. If sure, mm -hmm. yeah. Um so I'm a socialist and uh, therefore um, I come from a lens of class consciousness and class analysis. Uh, I believe that identity politics, the identity politics that is in play in the theater community is a neoliberal identity politic where we see our identities as commodities and as currency. And the current currency is how much of a victim can I possibly be? So I will pile on every possible identity that I can find uh, in order to be seen as a victim. I'm making, I mean, I'm kind of exaggerating here, but uh, I, I'm only ex exaggerating to make a point. <laughs> um, 
So the identity politic that I am interested in is the identity politics that was uh, articulated by the Combahee River Collective in 1977. Um, it was a group of uh, black um, feminists, uh, I think all of them were lesbians, um, who were basically saying to their comrades in the Black Panther Party, because they were all in the Black Panther Party, hey, you guys, uh, we're women and we're gay. So yes, we are all black, you know, and we are all oppressed and ex uh, historically exploited and enslaved in the United States because we're all black, we understand all this. But as women and as lesbians, we have to deal with a different set of oppressions than you men do. Uh, and so they termed the, the, they coined the term, I'm sorry, uh, intersectionality. Mm -hmm. Uh, their movement was not a separatist movement, right? They were like, hey, we're all in this together and we're going to continue with the struggle. But we need to know that once we triumph, whatever our vision is, right? Once we triumph, uh, we need to take into account that uh, if you're a woman, in their case, this is what they were saying, if you're a woman and you're a lesbian, there are different rights that you are also fighting for that need to be on the table of our collective vision, they today have made it very clear that they were never a separatist movement. They were never a fundamentalist movement. Um, so that kind of identity politic, which is a socialist identity politic, is the identity politic that I uh, subscribe to. Uh, the neoliberal identity politics that is in the theater community, which I cl call a middle class uh, politic, completely denies class. Class never goes into it, right? So I can sit here going, hey, I'm brown. Hey, you know, I'm what, you know, everything, right? Uh, you know, I have mental illness. I have this, I have that. And it, interestingly, actually never bring up my social class. And I think that's because the, the lens and sensibility in the theater community is a middle-class liberal lens. And you yourself do not have to be middle class and uh, white and liberal to have that lens, right? Yeah. But that is the lens yeah. for yeah. the most part that we are operating from and the, the stories that we are telling, you know? Um, so that but even when we tell a refugee story, except for my plays, right? <laughs> At the end of the day, there's usually a white savior element. Mm -hmm. You know, there's usually, you know, the refugee is nothing but a victim and is so happy to be here, you know, and um, performing gratitude to the mainstream. Um, to me, that's a white middle class liberal lens, right? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. again, I could go on about this for a while. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe I'll stop there for a sec. It, it, it's a it's a piece though that I think is almost never in education because mm. it's 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 not only in the theater world; it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. the, the, this invisibility of class. I mean, I have students in the class who um, have four jobs. <clears throat> I don't mean this class necessarily, but you know, I always have students with four jobs and I have students who, you know, fly to the other side of the world for the, for the break in March or February, whenever it is. And that, th th there's, I don't mean they're not aware of each other and there's not sensitivity. I'm not saying there isn't, but it's not talked about. It's, it, you know, it's just not talked about. Um, and I want to, one of the students in the comment actually noticed this and asked the question, you know, why do we see performance as an intrinsically liberal activity, which was thought was an interesting perceptive response to what you were saying. But it's one thing to, to, to know it, to say it's, you know, neoliberal, which I think a lot of people probably could use a little, you know, Reader's Digest on, what does that even mean? But we're, if, we're direct, if, we're, if, we, if we're inside neoliberalism, and if, as seems to be the case, some people get really, really mad at you, get really upset, not only at you, but at anyone who tries to open this up and say, maybe this is not productive, never mind ethical. You know, where's it getting us? Where do we start if there's so much rage and anger and it's, you know, how do you shift people's perceptions so they can hear you, I guess, is what I'm asking. How does, how, where might me as a teacher working with students who I'm, offering the opportunity to hear you, you know, think about that. Yeah, so just to, just to say something about neoliberalism, which could take 10 hours, of course, but just a very, yeah. <laughs> very, very basic, basic uh, uh, definition of the ideology of neoliberalism without even getting into the 
economic system of neoliberalism, was, which is deregulated capitalism and privatization. Uh, the ideology, the basic ideology states that the basic characteristic of human relations is competition as opposed to solidarity and cooperation. And that there is no society, that's why we don't talk about class in neoliberalism, there is only the individual. And there I'm quoting Margaret Thatcher, right, who was uh, one of the uh, uh, leaders of neoliberalism in the world in the early 80s. And she, that's what, that was her slogan, there is no society, in other words, there's no solidarity, there's no cooperation, there's no community, there's no collective, there is just the individual. And individuals are meant to compete with each other. Uh, which is what I was referring to when I said neoliberal identity politics being all about the self and my identity being a currency uh, that I uh, deal with, right? That I, that I use as a currency. Um, in terms of the anger and the rage, uh, to be blunt, I, I actually, you know, when I was in the Chilean resistance, when I, from the time I was 18 till I was 22, I was the furthest thing from angry and enraged. I was extremely excited and terrified. So like I lived in a state of terror 24 hours a day because uh, I knew that if I was caught, I would be tortured to death. And I'm not exaggerating, that's, that's what would have happened. Um, but I was actually extremely excited. Um, and the people who were my direct superiors were elders to me, they could have been my parents. Mm -hmm. My direct uh, superior was an Aymara indigenous man from Northern Chile who started working when he was four years old. Um, I, I, his voice is still in my head, like he leads me wherever I go. Like I always refer back to him. What would he think about this? What would he say about this? Uh, so I actually was not angry and enraged. I think what's happening right now, and I have to, um, um, I think uh, contextualize this, that uh, all the young people on this call, all you've ever known is neoliberalism. That's literally all you've ever known. Those of us who are older on this call can remember state capitalism. And uh, in my life, I can remember socialism. I was very young when Chile was socialist, but I actually remember it. Um, so knowing that all you've ever known is neoliberalism um, that, that's, that's how I'm going to refer, like, I, I, I have that in my brain when I'm talking to younger people, let's put it that way, right? So, um, I don't believe that you should always trust your feelings, right? So anger and rage, those are feelings. Uh, I do not subscribe to the ideology that one has to always trust one's feelings. In fact, that is a very dangerous thing to do. You should actually very rarely trust your feelings. Mm -hmm. I also do not believe that what doesn't kill you makes you weaker. I believe the opposite. And I and every elder person on this call and even all of you are living proof of that. You know, I do believe that what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. There is no such thing as safety. We are in planet earth, right? Just go for a walk in nature and uh, look at it through the lens of there is no such thing as safety. And I think you will understand what I mean. Um, and I do not believe that the world is divided into good and evil. Uh, to me, that's a fundamentalism. Like if I walk around thinking that the world is divided into good people and evil people, then I'm, I am actually a fundamentalist. So if you look at any fundamentalisms, whether it's, you know, a religious fundamentalism or an ideological fundamentalism, that's basically the basic tenet. The world is divided into good and evil. I am good. If you do not agree with every word that comes out of my mouth, you are evil, period, end of story. <laughs> so so um, that's what I have to say about, uh, about the feelings thing. I think all of those things are connected to the anger and the rage, um, yeah. I think that's really, really helpful, really, really important. And it, it seems to me that the, the biggest irony of all is that it, the politics of identity as it's lived out and expressed right now, which ironically is somehow seems to be in the name of community, but really isn't, is the best tool of neoliberalism. It's so friggin' helpful to the powers that be. There's no unitedness. 
And something that really struck me, I think it's the beginning of your second biography when you talk about hearing Thomas Borges speak, you're, you're, with, your, you're with your community and you're listening to him speak and what does he have to say? He says, unite. And it really struck me, how can we have an organized movement if everybody is in their little silos, right? I wonder if you could, I can ask one more thing and then I'll see if there's a question or two from our guests who will then go away. <laughs> I mean, sadly, <sighs> uh, I was listening to a talk by Samil Gandesha. Yes. Vancouver. Okay, and he was talking about some of these issues and he said that there's been a misplaced equation of offense and harm. And I wondered if you could say anything about the difference between being offended and being harmed. Yeah, I think that there's there are two completely different things, and it's really uh, uh, sad to me that they have been uh, they're kind of uh, synonymous all of a sudden. Uh, I can be offended by pretty much anything, and you know who cares really? I don't care. You know, like, <laughs> but how to, okay, what is my point? Harm I think has more to do with hate speech. Right, like harm for me is more like something violent has just happened, you know, like a neo-Nazi just came up to me and said, all spics must die, right? That's, that's harmful speech, right? That's harmful speech. And um, in Canada, that's hate speech. So it's actually illegal, right? So that's harmful for sure. Um, if somebody says to me, you know, I'm right wing, I don't believe that white privilege is a thing. I think Thatcher was the best. That's not harmful to me at all. I'm just like, oh, great. We disagree. <laughs> we can have a debate about it or not. Um, thanks for letting me know, like whatever, right? Like, I'm not even offended by that. I'm just like, oh, there's different views in the world. That's why the world's an interesting place. Excellent. Um, so I think that they are, and I understand that some people, like there are people, who, and, and I've heard this many times, oh, I am harmed. I am deeply hurt because somebody said that they don't believe white privilege exists. For me, A, you're overstating harm. <laughs> B, if that is truly harmful to you, you must have had an extremely, extremely, extremely easy and sheltered life. And C, I don't think that's what's harming you. I think that maybe you do have some trauma in your background. And for some reason, somebody saying this to you has triggered that trauma. But this person is actually not hurting you by stating a point of view that is nowhere near hate speech that is just different to your point of view. Um, so going back to the harm versus offense thing, I think they're two completely different things. I think harm is when somebody directs hate speech at you. Thank you, thank you. Anything from, I'm so, I didn't say welcome to our visitors, welcome to our, we've got some of our faculty here, I'm so pleased to see. Any, any questions from you before we transition to the students? Okay. I just want to say one thing, thank you very much and the endorsement to, uh, to speak out as you, as you were saying, at this point is very, very helpful. Mm. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I just want to add, I mentioned to Carmen before this officially started that I, I had the honor of giving a keynote speech at a high school drama festival in, in Vancouver. And I was talking a little bit, touching on cancel culture. All I could talk about was what it's like to be a, a, an old straight white man in this theatrical culture that we're in now. And I was talking about cancel culture and I, I cited uh, Drew Hayden Taylor's piece in the Globe and Mail and a couple of other things and Carmen's speech on cancel culture. And I am so grateful that somebody who is not an old straight white guy is addressing these issues in a, in a sane and inclusive way that isn't simply reactionary mm -hmm. uh, because it's very easy to get mistaken for the guy next door to me when I talk about this stuff. So thank you for that. Oh, no, thank you. And, and, and that's, that's kind of the reason why I, I did that, that video because I mean, the reason I did that video is because I was hired to do it by the PUSH Festival, right? But the reason why I chose that topic is that I, I almost feel like at this point that it's my duty, precisely because I'm a woman of color, right? That if I was a white guy, I would just be called a racist for, for putting that video out there. 
And interestingly, even though I am a woman of color who's a political refugee and a survivor of crimes against humanity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, uh, I, I was still called, uh, I was still told publicly, how dare you? You're too privileged to put that out there. You are a privileged person, right? And it, so, and, and I'm kind of glad that happened because then other people like you, John, for example, like not, not you personally, but people like you, <laughs> Yeah, I get it. Yeah. Look, looked at that response and went, okay, well now 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 we're now we're in cuckoo land, right? Now <laughs> you no, know, if a person like Carmen who has had a very public um, life of activism in the theater community for 31 years, fighting systemic racism in the theater community and paying for it, like paying a huge price for it, you know, it's, it's Speaking of cancel culture, I was blacklisted for most of the 90s and the early 2000s for fighting systemic racism in the theater. Um, if she can't say this, then 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 where are we? Right? Mm -hmm. what, you know, where are we? What this is ridiculous now. So I almost feel like it's my duty, precisely because of my identity, which is uh, the irony. <laughs> and yeah. you know, John, you're you're also you're also a Jewish man, and that's also become pretty invisible in these conversations, I yeah. think. Yeah. I chose the best possible time and place in the history of the world to get born Jewish. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I acknowledge my privilege. <laughs> I get it. Yeah. Right. Yeah, but, but nonetheless, we're a multitude of things, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just, uh, hi, Carmen. Hi. I'm just going to echo, echo what um, Natalie and John have said, and, and, and thank you, thank you um, for, even maybe giving us a, a place to begin in our classes. Uh, this is a discussion that I think is just so vital and important for us to have in a, in a, in a free way and to, to hope that a classroom situation is as free as we're gonna get is really inspiring to me. Um, and also thank you so much for bringing up, I think the thing that, to the things that are stopping it is that people are not using sanity and they're not using reason. They are using the feelings and that seems to be um, enough. Mm -hmm. And it isn't, right? It, it, it isn't enough to address this. Mm -hmm. We have to speak um, about this and for these things and to these things with the sense of sanity, with the sense of reason, or we are doomed, mm -hmm. yeah? Anyway, um, it's so nice to see my students here. Be good to yourselves, everybody. Thank you, Chip. <laughs> All right, I'm going to officially stop this recording um, for a sec. Okay, let's hopefully, hopefully it's a new recording and not the same one because then we